it's fed by the incoming acetyl-CoA. Right? Now, we are getting something out of it, and what we're getting out of it is energy. That's the most important thing. Those oxidations of those acetyl-CoA's, which is what's really happening in the citric acid cycle, are generating a lot of energy for us. Remember I said we're going to get 38 ATPs if we go all the way through glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. So that's very valuable to us. Yes, sir? Does something ever stop one of these reactions from internalizing glycolysis, how one of the products would go off branch? Good question. Does something ever stop one of these processes? The citric acid cycle and the glyoxylate cycle as well is not, are, are not as regulated as glycolysis is. What, what did I say in class was the main regulation of the citric acid cycle? Ultimately, it's oxygen, but what's the, what's the, the, the molecules that are in short supply? NAD and FAD, right? Okay. Without oxygen, we don't have NAD and FAD. So that's, those are the primary regulators. And when I talk about metabolic control, which I'll probably talk about tomorrow, um, you'll, I, I think you're going to see why that lack of oxygen and how that lack of oxygen actually does control these pathways comes into play. Okay? Okay. Clear as mud. That is the glyoxylate pathway. Um, there's the isocitrate lyase reaction. If you want to memorize something, no, you're not going to need to. The sixth carbon goes to a four plus a two. And here's the malate synthase reaction. Glyoxylate plus oxaloacetate is giving us malate. OK. Well, that's what we need to say about the citric acid cycle. Um, I'm going to turn our attention now to electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. And believe me, to try to squeeze all of this into one lecture a day, it's probably not going to happen. So we'll give it our best shot. Well, we're finally at a point now where We've been generating a lot of NADH and FADH2. We made two of those in um, glycolysis from one glucose. We made two by the oxidation of two pyruvates to make acetyl-CoA. We made an additional, for each acetyl-CoA, we made an additional three NADHs and one FADH2. So there's a lot of reduced electron carriers sitting around. And I've told you that the cell has to recycle those. If the cell doesn't recycle those, processes are going to stop. If you run out of it in the cytoplasm, glycolysis is going to stop. If you run out of it in the mitochondrion, the citric acid cycle is going to stop. Okay? So it's important for us to understand how that recycling occurs. And that recycling occurs through the phenomenon known as electron transport and ultimately oxidative phosphorylation. Specifically, the rege regeneration of NAD and FAD occurs in the first process, that is electron transport, and the synthesis of ATP occurs in the second process, oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so um, we talked about mitochondrial structure before. I'm not going to go through that uh, again, but I will remind you that we have a, an intermitochondrial membrane that's very important. It has these Christi that it's in here, and this intermitochondrial membrane is where most of, not most of, in fact, all of electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation occurs. It's in this membrane where these protein complexes that I'll be describing to you are all located. The intermitochondrial membrane is the most important membrane of the mitochondrion. It is very, very impermeable to most substances. Just like we saw that I said what, things that could cross the cell membrane were oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and uh, water. Okay? Similarly, we see the same things happening uh, with um, the intermitochondrial membrane. Virtually nothing else crosses that membrane very readily. And that's important because, as we will see, that membrane is a barrier to protons. Something as tiny as a proton cannot make it through that membrane without assistance. OK. Let's look at electron transport and see some, some, some big, big things going on. All right. What's electron transport? I like to think of electron transport as a, an electrical circuit inside of our cells. And it literally is that, because electrons are moving the movement of those electrons through some protein complexes I'll be describing to you, 
is used to do something. And the something that's done is to pump and move protons across the membrane. So if we think about our computer, it uses electrons to process data. It uses electrons to display a screen. It uses electrons to store information. It uses electrons to connect with the internet. Okay? All of these work sorts of things are done by electrons. We have electrons in our cells that are doing work things. And the work things that they are doing is what I will uh, colloquially describe as charge the battery. Okay? Electrons moving through our mitochondrial inner membrane are charging a battery. So electron transport is largely that. It's charging a battery. Well, how does this happen? Well, if we look at um, reduced electron carriers, we see two of them on the screen here. One is NADH, the second is FADH2. Okay? This is a little misleading because it makes it look like FADH2 is donating its electrons to coenzyme Q, and that's not completely correct. Okay? We'll see why it depicts that in a second. But suffice it to say, this is not exactly anatomically correct. All right. Well, here's all this NADH that we've, been, we've made. This NADH that you see on the screen is all in the matrix of the mitochondria. The stuff that's on the cytoplasm, the stuff from glycolysis, is not on the screen. We'll talk about that later. Okay? So the NADH that you see on the screen, the FADH2 that you see on the screen, they're all in the mitochondrial matrix, and they've all been essentially made by either the citric acid cycle, which we've just talked about, or fatty acid oxidation, which we'll talk about next. Both of these processes generate a lot of NADH and a lot of FADH2. We want to recycle them. All right, the first thing that happens is we start the recycling process. NADH donates its electrons to a complex. This complex is labeled on here as FMN, which is a really dumb name for a complex because it's only one of many things in the complex. The complex actually has a name. The name's about this long, and most of us call it complex one. So NADH donates electrons to complex one. You say, what happens to the protons? They're released. Okay? In this case, one proton is released, a proton from NADH. The complex is donating electrons to here, to complex one. The protons are released. That leaves us with an NAD+. Plus. We have just recycled the NADH. That was pretty simple. And the electrons now are located in complex one. And as the electrons pass through complex one, they pass to this thing over here called coenzyme Q or CoQ. Okay? The movement of the electrons through complex one causes complex one to do something. There's energy passing through it, just like the energy passing through your cell phone allows you to connect to a network and pass information along. The movement of the electrons through complex one causes complex one to grab protons from the matrix and kick them outside. That is to move it across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this guy, this complex one, is a proton pump. The energy source for the pump is the movement of electrons through it. Yes, sir, Stuart. So are there more, pro more than one proton that's kicked out? Is that your question? Yes. The answer is yes, there are. And you had a question also? Um, when it kicks it out of the matrix, where does it kick it to? It kicks it into that intermembrane space, the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So remember I said the outer membrane is kind of like a wet blanket? The protons can actually go through that outer membrane. But for the most part, like a wet blanket, that's going to kind of stay hanging around that, that inner mitochondrial membrane. We'll see that's important in a bit. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to take you through the, th the pathway, and then I'm going to come back and tell you why those movements of protons are, uh, are important. Here is the, pro the electrons. They've come, and they've hit coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q, by the way, electrons, when NADH has them, it passes them off in pairs. Electrons start out in the system in pairs. 
By the time they're coming out at the bottom, they're coming out one at a time. That means there has to be something that is taking those pairs, taking them two at a time and passing them off one at a time. I'd like to think of that as a traffic cop who stops traffic and then lets only selected traffic go through as appropriate. And that traffic cop is CoQ. Coenzyme Q is able to accept protons in pairs and pass them off one at a time. Coenzyme Q is also able to accept electrons from a complex that contains FADH2. What does that mean? Okay. If you recall, when I, uh, when I talked about the citric acid cycle, I said that all of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle were contained in the matrix except for one. I didn't tell you what the one was. Now I'm going to tell you what the one is. The one enzyme of the citric acid cycle that is not contained in the matrix is succinate dehydrogenase. That enzyme, you may recall, used FAD and produced FADH2. The succinate dehydrogenase complex we refer to as complex 2. Complex 2 donates electrons also to coenzyme Q. And coenzyme Q happily takes, the, takes a pair of them and passes them off one at a time. So we see electrons from NADH coming through here. We see electrons from FADH2 coming from here. They both intersect at coenzyme Q, and coenzyme Q passes them on down here. So it literally is a traffic cop. Let's look to see what happens next. Electrons pass from coenzyme Q, and they go to another complex that has a honking name that we call complex 3. Okay. Complex 3, like complex 1, pumps protons. Notice complex 2 didn't pr pump any protons. But complex 1 and complex 3 both pump protons. Complex 3 passes its electrons off. By the way, don't confuse electrons and protons. Protons are things being pumped. Electrons are the things moving through the complexes. Complex 3 donates its electrons to something called cytochrome C, and that's the one place where the name on there actually is correct, cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a small membrane protein. It's found in the, uh, the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria. It accepts electrons from complex 3. And it's very small, so it's able to move back and forth across the membrane and donate things very easily. What does it donate them to? It donates them to complex 4. So that's pretty easy to memorize, right? NADH goes complex 1, coenzyme Q, complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4. FADH goes complex 2, coenzyme Q, complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4. And look down here at the bottom. Those electrons ultimately have to go somewhere. We can't just pass them on and pass them on and pass them on. They ultimately have to make it to their destination. And their destination is oxygen. This is why you breathe heavily when you exercise. This is why you need oxygen. Because if you run out of oxygen, this process stops. If this process stops, what happens to the concentration of NADH? It's going to go up because you're not dumping it off anymore. What's going to happen to the concentration of FADH2? It's going to go up because you've got no place to dump it off. This is why when cells run out of oxygen, they can't run the citric acid cycle anymore because they can't regenerate NAD or FAD. Oxygen is what we refer to as the terminal electron acceptor. Yes? 